As an undergraduate, I was a double major in philosophy and religion. In some ways, those two fields are quite similar. Both are interested in asking and exploring the big questions. Who am I? What is art? What is the meaning of life? What really matters? Why is there something rather than nothing? What happens after we die? These two fields are also in some ways quite different. There's a classic embodiment of their difference um, in the question, what has Athens to do with Jerusalem? Philosophy literally means the love of wisdom. If any of you know anyone named Sophia, that philia of philosophy, philia Sophia, Sophia means wisdom. Philia is one of the Greek words for love. So philosophy is about the love of wisdom and can connote more of a focus on what can we know and speculate about based on our grounded, earthly, terrestrial, human experience along the lines of our UU fifth source humanist teachings which counsel us to heed the guidance of reason and the results of science and warn us against idolatries of the mind and spirit. In contrast, religion can be can note more of an openness to faith, to transcendence, to revelation that can come from beyond our human perspective as in our UU first source of direct experience of that transcending mystery and wonder affirmed in all cultures which point us to a renewal of the spirit and an openness to the forces that create and uphold life. All six of our UU sources are on the back of your order of service. Most of my first two decades of being raised in a theologically conservative congregation in the Midlands of South Carolina were sort of like swimming around in a familiar lake. Declaring a double major in religion and philosophy was like suddenly finding myself facing the ocean for the first time. It was inspiring and exhilarating and overwhelming and scary. As I lived in the tension between these twin perspectives, I increasingly sought to bring them into dialogue. I began asking my uh, favorite religion professors about religious responses to all of this 20th century philosophy that I was learning. I began asking my favorite philosophy professors about how postmodern philosophy might respond to 20th century theology as it was being done in ways that were seeking to be relevant to our contemporary context. Now keep in mind I graduated in the year 2000 from college, so the 21st century was still in the future at that point. I wasn't thinking about 21st century religion and philosophy, I was just wrestling with the 20th at that point. And around that time, I remember noticing a poster on the bulletin board outside the philosophy department about a conference called The Prayers and Tears of Jacques Derrida, Religion Without Religion. Now, I was intrigued. Uh, Derrida, he died a few years ago in 2004. He was a French postmodern philosopher known for his work on deconstruction which emphasizes the gaps in knowledge, the ways that you can take traditional contemporary texts and ideas and pull at the threads that will begin unraveling them. He was also famously an atheist. So what was this about his prayers and his tears? Turns out that Derrida was Jewish by birth and that he surprised um, both his fans and his critics later in his career with a post-structuralist autobiography that played on the life and writings of the 4th century Christian saint, Augustine of Hippo, or as I like to call him, Gussie. <laughs> it's a long other story about Augustine. So, um, in doing so, Derrida never stopped being an atheist, but in the spirit of deconstruction, he was interested in exploring what he called repetitions with a critical difference, or as he said, difference. <laughs> so, the ways that we can start with the material that is around us in the world and playfully and creatively make new meaning that is relevant to us. And I came to learn that that title, The Prayers and Tears of Jacques Derrida, was itself a, place, a play on tears, as in crying, and tears, as in tearing something apart. So the tears and also the tears. And, as the, and that subtitle, Religion Without Religion, was about seeking that original, authentic, true experience that is actually the source of many religious movements, but that often becomes corrupted and institutionalized over time. 
Derrida's work is quite difficult to read. Have any of you tried to read Derrida? It is not, I, my heart is with you if you have <laughs> uh, But as I researched further, I discovered a guy named John Caputo. Uh, he was born around 1940, a uh, much more accessible English-speaking philosopher doing intriguing scholarship that has some deep resonances with Derrida. If you're interested in learning more, probably the most accessible starting point for Caputo is his philosophical autobiography called Hoping Against Hope, Confessions of a Postmodern Pilgrim. Now in his late uh, 70s, Caputo has retired from full-time teaching, though as a scholar he does not share signs of slowing down anytime soon. If I were back in graduate school today and could sign up for a course studying the work of any one contemporary philosopher, from what I can tell, the philosopher currently at the peak of their career, who seems to be doing the most interesting cutting-edge work along these lines, is the French philosopher Catherine Malibu, who is a little less than a, tradition, a generation younger than Caputo. But right about this point, I'm pushing the limits of the permissible nerd threshold of <laughs> So uh, thank you for indulging me and giving a shout out to any of my fellow philosophy and or religion geeks out there. But allow me to pivot instead of diving into Malibu uh, to instead use Caputo as a way of reflecting on what the intersection of postmodern philosophy and religion may have to teach us today as Unitarian Universalists. Looking back, Caputo writes that some of his earliest and strongest and most visceral memories from when he was the age of some of these children that were before us earlier is of looking up at the vast starry night sky and feeling a creeping suspicion arise within him that no one knows we're here. But he kept those doubts to himself. Remember, he was born in 1940. He was raised as a pre-Vatican II Roman Catholic. He was taught that not only all the answers, but all the questions that he needed to ask were in the Baltimore Catechism. <laughs> but as he grew older, similar to the intersection of religion and philosophy that I described earlier, Caputo's first serious academic work was a study of the German existentialist philosopher Martin Heidegger and the 14th century Christian mystic Meister Eckhart. An insight from that earlier work that continued to resonate through all of Caputo's scholarship decades later is one short verse from Heidegger. It goes like this. The rose. The rose is without why. It blossoms because it blossoms. It cares not for itself. It asks not if it's seen. I'll read that one more time. The rose is without why. It blossoms because it blossoms. It cares not for itself, and it asks not if it's been seen. For those of us drawn to the big questions, who am I? What is the meaning of life? Why is there something rather than nothing? What might a rose, just like those roses that we blessed the children with earlier, what might the, that have to teach us this morning? Keep in mind the first line of that Heideggerian verse of the rose is without a why. Caputo says that despite his childhood inkling of looking up and thinking, I'm not sure anyone knows we're here. He says that if someone had told him then that there might be no why, no absolute unchanging reason or purpose for human existence, then he would have left religion immediately instead of wrestling with it his whole life. He had been taught to, uh, that, you that you behaved and you believed in order to be rewarded in the next world, to get heaven or avoid hell. That was why fire insurance, right? <laughs> but in the same way that Derrida riffed on both his Jewish heritage and Augustine's confessions to gesture toward a postmodern religion without religion, Caputo, who spent so much of his early life in a Roman Catholic private school, has come to have a sense of what he calls the emerging of a god who would have landed me in public school. As a philosopher, his starting point is the love of wisdom that we can know and speculate about based on what we have observed for ourselves. And for Caputo, one consummate example is what he calls the evidence of the rose, wrestling with the evidence of, these, of a rose in front of us. 
From a certain point of view, one might suppose it would make sense for nothing to have ever existed. Think about it. For anything to exist, shouldn't there have to be something pre-existing that would have to create that something? And then for that to exist, there'd have to be something pre-existing to create that, and so on and so forth. If you've ever looked at two mirrors at the same time, you get that infinite regression, right? It's what Plato called the third man problem, that God created us, we created God. That's the, that's the third man problem. These are the sort of things that young philosophy and religion majors talk about at 3 a.m. <laughs> Full disclosure, it's also what they talk about at 3 p.m. Um, but uh, it's not the case that nothing <clears throat> exists. Quite the opposite. The world, the universe, is a whirling, buzzing, wondrous spectacle. Did any of you see the recent photos of Jupiter from the NASA mission, the Juno mission? If you haven't, Google it later. Incredible, I and mean, they're just, they're amazing. Uh, for Caputo, the evidence of the rose is the proof that there is not merely nothing, but that the something that is this world, this universe, is often so breathtakingly beautiful, even as there is also immense pain and suffering. Caputo's next step shifts from philosophy toward religion. It will be a step too far for some of you, but his intention is a Derridian, paradoxical religion without religion, a recapitulation of the God of his childhood, but with a critical difference. <laughs> to adapt a famous quote from Gary Da, if what you mean by the word God is an old white man in the sky, some combination of Santa Claus and Zeus, then both Gary Da and Caputo would quote, rightly pass for an atheist. In that spirit, Caputo's clever turn of phrase is that for him, God, like that, does not exist. But in his experience, God, nevertheless, paradoxically, insists. God does not exist, but God insists. <coughs> Remember that he's trying to take an inherited tradition that built up around the word God over, you know, centuries, years, millennia in Western civilization, and then creatively extended with a critical postmodern difference. So instead of asking the question of whether a supreme being with the name God exists, Caputo would instead invite us to open ourselves to the possibility of a God, whatever we mean by that, that insists. He would say, through events. An event that he says might be getting itself done underneath the word God, which is, of course, just a um, human construction. That congregation in Manhattan that Ben mentioned, um, Horace Church, the minister there for many years, used to say a lot, God is not God's name. God is a word in human language, right? This event is more subjective than objective, more experiential than intellectual, more a verb than a noun, <clears throat> more a becoming than a being. Let me give you another repetition with a critical difference. This time, um, on that young Caputo who grew up looking up at the night sky and with that closely guarded secret of wondering that perhaps no one knows we're here. He grew up to have two sons, and when his older son was seven, they were watching TV, and a beloved character on that TV show was shown dying, and he actually had died in real life as well. His son turned to him and said, Dad, does everyone die? Caputo confesses that his question threw me into a panic as a parent. I wanted to disappear into thin air, even though in a way, he was actually asking about my field of specialization. He says, I did not say that I have spent my life staring into that abyss. Then when, I, then when he hears me upstairs typing in my study, that's actually what I'm writing about. Then in a sense, I have never written about anything other than death, than God and death. Whatever difference between those two spectral companions may turn out to be, if there is any difference at all. But eventually, in response to my son's question, I said, uh, his question, Dad, does everyone die? I managed to say one word, yes, even though I have written thousands more. But in the way of young children, another question followed, <laughs> everyone? <laughs> Caputo says, I could feel his reply rising from a disbelief from an abyss so immense and inescapable, that an abyss so immense and inescapable could be so commonplace. 
My God, I thought, was there no way out of this question? How can I escape from this room? Eventually, Buddha writes that he said, still keeping his composure, I said yes again. But I knew in my heart that his life was starting to change. Here in the early 21st century, we know that this blue marble on which we find ourselves floating in orbit in the inky blackness of space around our fiery sun, this planet, it's not the center of the universe as we once thought. We're merely the third rock from the sun. We're but a tiny part of a much larger universe story that has been evolving for more than 13.8 billion years across more than two trillion galaxies, trillion with a T. But the religion and philosophy of the rose invites us to consider that so much beauty is nonetheless possible. Like the rose, anything we create or achieve individually or collectively, it's not going to last forever. Those roses that we gave those children this morning, they're going to wilt and die. But they were beautiful this morning. And it makes it all the more valuable and precious in the meantime. May we embrace, may we cherish, may we celebrate one another on the short time that we do have together on this earth. I would usually have ended around there, but given this past week, I cannot. There are a few words that I feel compelled to add. President Trump's announcement on Thursday that he plans to withdraw the United States from the Paris Climate Accord is a world historic tragedy. In the scope of the known universe, this planet, the biodiversity on it, are rare and precious. And here's the truth in the words of the contemporary environmental prophet, Wendell Berry, whose um, work I commend to you. Berry says, whether we and our politicians know it or not, nature is party to all of our deals. Nature is party to all of our decisions. And she has more votes. She has a longer memory, and she has a sterner sense of justice. Some cynical politicians may deny that climate change is real for their own short-term gain, but as Philip K. Dick used to say, reality is what doesn't go away even when you stop believing in it. You can have all the all facts you want, but reality is what doesn't go away even when you stop believing in it. In that spirit, and in the spirit of Caputo's religion of the rose, let's rise and body your spirit. Let's sing together in your teal hymnal in 1064, Blue Bow Country.